Hello, my name is Philippa Vincent Connolly and I'm a historian specialising in disability history. And the reason why I'm specialising in disability history is because I have a disability myself. The cat's joined in on the, on the Zoom call, which is fine. That's, that's the lockdown rules. Um, and, and basically, I'm here to sort of talk about my experience of disability as um, a child and, and growing up with cerebral palsy, which is what I have. Um, I was born in 1970, so attitudes were vastly different than they are today. Um, I was born early at 26 weeks and I weighed two pounds, two ounces. And because of that, I had brain damage due to lack of oxygen at birth, which meant that parts of my body that control my legs and my muscles don't work properly and that I ended up with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Now the doctors said to my parents that um, I would end up in a wheelchair by the time I was 10. I wouldn't amount to anything. I wouldn't do, be able to do much in life. And <laughs> as I've done all my life, I have defied everybody. Um, refused to be boxed in or stigmatised by my disability and I basically got on with it. I had one operation when I was two years old to stretch my tendons on the back of my legs purely because I used to um, walk or stand on my toes and I'd wear through a pair of shoes in two weeks. Um, I didn't walk until I was um, six years old properly unaided and um, I went to a special school from three years old in order to make sure that I had physio every single day along with being given a basic education in order to get me mobile and in those days disabled people were very much institutionalized into like a Shaftesbury Society boarding school and that's where I was at the time locally I was 20 minutes down the road from my parents there was no need for me to be a boarder i should have gone home every night but the way it was i i didn't i would go home every weekend to my parents and that was how it was um it was very draconian quite victorian in its attitudes towards the children um a christian ethos there which was was good of course but um i found that um I was very much the most able of the students there, especially in my dormitory. So if we, for instance, had a student who had to be strapped into bed at night in case they rolled over and fell out, um, then, or if any complications happened with anybody or anybody needed help to get up to go to the loo in the middle of the night, Muggins would be the one that would end up getting out of bed, bare feet, trying to sort of go down the corridor as quickly as I could and find a nurse to come and, and help, which, you know, was, was fine because I was helping other people. But um, the, the dormitory side of life wasn't fantastic. Um, we had to be in bed by six. We had no TV. We had certain meals on certain days. For example, on a Friday, we'd always have a fish dinner and I hated fish. I couldn't even bear the smell of it. And at times I'd be sat in front of a, a meal on a Friday, which I refused to eat. And they'd sit me there for two hours in front of the, the meal, missing afternoon school until I ate it. Um, it was in some ways it was good Christmases were amazing because there'd be these guests that would come in who would do presentations for us as a school we'd have like ballet dancers coming in puppeteers actors that kind of thing to to, to make it Christmassy and a huge big Victorian Christmas tree with loads of lights and it was lovely in that respect and the food that would go around was brilliant and you could bring your siblings with you to join in and watch the end of sort of term festivities at Christmas. Um, we'd have sports day of a kind in the summer, um, things like that. The education um, was very basic. They didn't really expect you to, to learn to any sort of key stage or academic level. It was just like the basics of time table, times tables with maths, basics in English, helping you to be able to write. I mean, there were people, uh, there were students there who were spina bifida, who could barely talk, who 
couldn't move their arms and their legs at all, who were completely um, bound to a wheelchair. I hate that term, but they, they were. Um, two people like myself who were more able-bodied and able to do you know more than than others um, we'd have physio maybe um, two or three times a week depending on our disability um, do you remember those, those old gym benches that we used to have in school they turned them upside down for me so the biggest part of the bench was actually on the floor and they try and make me walk one foot in the other along the bottom of the plank of the bench to try and help me with my balance. That would be something that they would do. They would try to get me to go up and down the stairs without a rail, which I found really difficult. Um, they'd have like water sessions where they had a small swimming pool in the physio area, which was like, I don't know, um, four foot by four foot, really small. But they'd help us with our, um, our basic swimming and our muscle movements and things like that. Um, and it was it was quite difficult having that all under one roof and you felt quite isolated from the rest of society it was only at the weekends that you would go out and see your parents and you'd see everybody else getting on with their lives you know normally um and it made you feel protected in a way when you're institutionalized but also separated um, and I didn't really realise the impact my disability would have on my life for a very long time because I stayed in boarding school until I was nine years old. My mum was very strong willed and very brave. She fought to get me into mainstream school because she wanted me to have every opportunity I could possibly have. And um, a lot of people at that time thought that, no, you institutionalise disabled people, you put them out of sight and out of mind so that they can get the medical support that they need, so they can get the care they need. And, you know, let's not think about them trying to contribute to society. Let's not even consider that as a possibility. And that's how it was. And so I went to mainstream school and in the beginning I had kids who felt quite sorry for me or admired me for being brave or having a disability. Um, and initially I used walking sticks, um, which I quickly discarded because I didn't like using them and didn't be seen, want to be seen to be using them. Um, and then eventually the kids got used to me and then it would turn sometimes turn to bullying there'd be comments there'd be derogatory remarks there'd be oh let's push her over and see if she falls over and all those kinds of things and i just grew really strong armor against it and it just made me even tougher and more determined to get on with my life and do the best i possibly could so um and when I was a teenager, it was, or we all had the sort of like gothic, new romantic culture club, Malcolm, and that kind of thing, music scene going on. And I was very much into that. I wasn't a wham and Duran Duran girl, no rah-rah skirts for me. I, um, I sort of like took on that gothic kind of look and was into fashion and art and all the creative kind of things. And I hid behind that as a bit of a mask thinking it would sort of hide my disability a bit um, and gave me a different kind of identity. And so when I left school, I did, I did okay. I came out with um, equivalent to um, eight or nine GCSEs now, art, sewing, that kind of thing, history. And um, I went to study fashion design when I first left school from 16 to 18, really enjoyed doing that. But where I am in Sleepy Dorset, there's just no opportunities in that kind of in industry. So I started a degree up in Leicester for fashion and just didn't enjoy where I was. It was a bit of a culture shock for me to be up there. And so I came home and then I learned beauty therapy. And so from then on in, I was learning all about beauty therapy. I set up my own salon doing treatments for people. And eventually I got so into the, the nails and manicure side of things that I learned to be an educator in the industry. I got the first sort of qualifications in the MVQ in my area and, and eventually taught it. And I was doing a few celebrities nails behind the scenes who were on TV and 
um, getting involved in magazine shoots and um, demonstrating at Olympia and things like that. I really got into that and really enjoyed it. Um, and it was good because being into nails, I was sat behind a desk all, all the time, just talking to the general public um, and they'd offlay all their problems on me, which they do when they come into salons. And I just looked like everybody else. So I really loved that sort of field. And then <clears throat> in, in between times, when I was 32, I got married and I had two babies in quick succession, um, one at 33 and one at 34. Um, most people didn't think I would be able to have children, not because you know, I wasn't fertile or any problems of that nature. Just they worried about me being able to carry a baby full term and all that kind of thing. And how would I be in labour? And eventually I had both of them by cesarean sections. So they were smaller than normal, but they were healthy and brilliant. And, and that was all I, I was wanting, really. Um, and unfortunately, a couple of years after that, I ended up getting divorced um, because of domestic violence, which wasn't a great period in my life at all um, and um, I've been on my own since 2008 and when I when I got divorced I decided I was going to completely change my outlook and what I wanted to do and when I was a young younger when my mum was working at the weekends my grandparents used to pick me up and take me out to all these historical places in my locality. They take me to Blenheim and Wilton House and Ethel Hampton and all over the place. And I would walk around these stately homes with them and I'd look at these beautiful portraits of these wonderful people in their wonderful costumes. I think that's where my interest in fashion started from that. <laughs> and I think, well, why are they up there in that painting and people like me aren't? Why? Are they blessed to have lived in such wonderful palaces and places and houses when there are other people in society that are the complete opposite of that? And it got me thinking about it all. And, and that's where my love of history sort of blossomed was that and, and obviously starting to learn it at school. And I thought, right, I'm going to go through the Open University. I'm going to do a degree on history. So the same time as doing an online distance learning degree, I decided I'd go and work as a teaching assistant in a local school, secondary school, and I'd work with SEN students alongside them in a mainstream classroom, doing their lessons with them and supporting them and obviously um, non-disabled students as well. And I just had such a passion for education and for teaching and so the school put me into the history department and they put me into the um, design and technology department. So I was working alongside SEN students with the same passions as me. So one student, I helped her through a BTEC fashion, for example. Um, another student, a few other students, I would help them through their art GCSE and another couple of students, I'd be helping them through their history GCSE. And I'd be learning as much as them at the same time. And I absolutely loved it. And I thought, well, I'm doing this history degree. Why can't I then train to be a teacher? And that's when I had that light bulb moment of I really, really want to do this. And so I got my history degree out of the way, qualified with that in 2011. Open University are fantastic, especially for people with challenges, whether they be physical or learning disability, because they adapt to the the teaching to the particular student you don't have to go out of your home to do the learning unless you know there's a specific lecture that you want to attend in your local area and i find that really really inclusive with with places like the open university and we're all having to learn about online learning now with lockdown and the pandemic and all that kind of thing so i think that that's brilliant and um so I thought, right, what do I do next? So I need to get a teaching qualification. So I went back to the Open University and thought, right, I'll do my year's PGCE with the Open University. Unfortunately, they didn't do history as a PGCE. And they said, but hang on a minute, you've got fashion and um, design qualifications. We'll let you come in on that and with your history degree based on the fact that you could be a design technology teacher. 
So that was the route I rent, went down because I couldn't do a PGCE in history because it would mean traveling to another university. And at that particular time, I had two boys under 10 years old. So it was an impossibility. Um, so yeah, so in 2014, I got my qualification in teaching. Hey presto, that was amazing. Signed up with a supply agency and just the huge brick wall went up. Nothing to do with qualifications because I proved I was quite capable, but trying to get my NQT year under my belt was a nightmare. Trying to find schools to accommodate me because they had this fear of disability and a fear that um, it was a problem for them and something they couldn't address or support took me a long time. Um, and eventually I got my NQT year under my belt um, just within the five year time frame that you're meant to do it in. And went to a quite a challenging school in Southampton and the kids were amazing, but the behavior wasn't great. Um, and the first few days of being there, um, I'd get stared at, I'd get comments down the corridor. At the same time, I was by this time, um, for about a year, I'd been using a walking stick because unfortunately I found out that I had um, three vertebrae in my spinal column which were collapsing. And sometimes I felt quite secure using a walking stick, which was completely against my way of thinking. I just didn't want to, to use any walking aids, but I did anyway. And so the school accommodated me in terms of fire drills and all those kinds of things and looking after students and making sure I had them in on assembly on time and all those things. And I'd have one to one conversations with students and they'd say to me, Miss, why do you walk like that? Why are you like that? And then I'd have conversations and I explain back to them what had gone on for me as a child and how I was. And then they'd say, oh, right, OK. And then they change the subject to move on to something else as kids kids invariably do. Um, the school got me to do diversity assemblies where I was explaining about disability and difference. And I'd have some of the students in tears, not out of pity, but because it was fine, it was dawning on them that there were other people with other challenges out there besides what they were going through as teenagers. And obviously the students that had statements and were registered as special needs um, students could identify with me because they understood that I'd gone through similar limiting challenges to them. And so it helped the learning process for them. They could sort of like communicate with me better and not feel embarrassed by it. And I felt that I was making a real, real difference. And that's what I love about being a disabled teacher is because it's not just about the learning that happens in the classroom and their results and their progress and statistics and what key stage they're meeting at what time and have you bridged the progress gap and all of those things. It's, it was about the one-to-one the -one relationships you built with those students so that they understood you in a different way. And as a disabled teacher, I felt that I was reflecting the society, society that students see around them every day. And that's why I think it's really, really important. And there aren't enough disabled teachers at all out there. And I've come across a few um, teachers on social media with different disabilities who've said the same thing as me that they find it increasingly challenging to try and land themselves a permanent job and obviously once I'd done my NQT um, year the school didn't actually need me anymore because I was covering maternity uh, maternity year which was fine because I actually still I managed to get the NQT which was really important but since Covid I am signed up with three, three teaching agencies and I still can't get a permanent job. I think part of it is the fact that I live in lovely Dorset and once people move down here, they don't want to move away and they tend to stay in their jobs for like 20 odd years, you know, and stay in the same school for 20 years. So that's a difficulty and I can't move away because, you know, my children are going through school and I don't want to disrupt things for them. Um, and so I thought, right, okay, what can I do in the meantime while I'm trying to get all these teaching qualifications and experience under my belt? And I thought, well, let's look back at the history side of things. Let's look into that 
I started writing um, a fictional trilogy on, on Anne Boleyn and about a student who manages to time travel back to the Tudor period and the first volume of which I've published and I really enjoyed doing that. It was just a bit of fun, something for entertainment, not to be ac academically serious, but just something for people to enjoy reading. And, and I've published that in lockdown, which I think is quite a good feat considering it's taken me four years to write the trilogy and I'm, I'm just starting on volume two now to edit that down. Um, and the historian Susanna Lipscomb features in it as a speaker and, and she's read the, the first volume and she thought it was delightful. So she's, she's helped me a bit, bit with that. Um, and then I thought, what else could I do? And I just had this light bulb moment one day and I thought, well, why don't I look at disability history? Now, bearing in mind my own experience, for 45 plus years, I'd been shying away from even talking about disability. I would pretend I wasn't disabled. Not that I could pretend, because the moment you see me walking, you realise I have got a, a strange gait and that kind of thing. But I would block it out. I would ignore comments as they sort of flew past me when I'm walking down the street. My sons would notice the looks and the stares and the comments more than I did. And they'd say to me, oh, mum, they've just said this or mum, they've just said that. And I just said, don't worry about it. Forget it. It's people's ignorance. Just just don't worry about it. And I would sort of block it out. And then I thought, no, I need to challenge it head on, not just for other people, but for myself. Because if I faced up to it, what could, what could the possibility of that mean? And so I sent off a proposal for a book to a few people. And at first I was going to do this gigantic book with the whole of disability history from the whole of millennium in it. And the commissioning editor got back to me. She said, you can't do that. It would be huge. You know, you'd never write it. Um, you need to break it down. And I thought, well, what am I most interested in? What period am I most interested in in history? And I thought, right, Tudors. Let's look at the Tudors and disability. And that's where my first nonfiction book was born. And it was just addressing the fact that disability was out there in the 16th century and it did exist just as much as it exists now. The only dilemma about writing about the history is that the Tudors saw disabled people as a normal part of integrated society and therefore they weren't documented. It wasn't that there was a stigmatism as such to disability because so many people were injured in wars or in farming accidents or you know things like that, that it was just commonplace. So it's been difficult to piece together all of that for the book there's not anecdotal stories as such but there's a few characters that are quite significant in the period with disabilities and that's what I've, I've focused on so it's been a learning journey for me because it's not only taught me to write academically but it's also taught me to face my own history in a, a different way as part of the disabled community which I shied away from for so long um so that's that's where the writing sort of comes from and, and now i've even lo i'm looking at doing a phd specifically in disability history and the tudors next year i've got a university um who is looking to try and sponsor me so that i can do the phd and not it not cost me myself so that i can add to the research um in, in that specific area, which I'm really excited about if it does actually sort of get off the ground. And fancy me being a doctor, you know, with cerebral palsy. I'm not, you know, not a medical doctor, but a doctor nonetheless. So that really excites me and the opportunities are there, are there for that eventually, you know, hopefully. So, um, and the, the last thing that I'm doing at the moment, or have been doing in the last few weeks is getting involved with a historical drama series that a friend of mine is trying to produce and get off the ground. It's in pre-production, which features disability from the Tudors. Um, it's nothing to do with my book, 
but it's based on real life people who had disability in that period with a story written around those particular people and we are featuring disabled actors in that series in full historically accurate costume which my friend is making and we've done a bit of pilot filming at Hampton Court Palace which was absolutely a thrill because I love that place uh, and also I've done a few pieces to camera talking about the history and talking about what why we're doing the series and, and that kind of thing so he's looking to get funding for the for the rest of the series um, for that and for the costumes and my friend and I hoping to be extras in it, which will be quite exciting. I've said to him, so long as I'm sat down in the banqueting scenes and you can't see me walk, I'll be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> no black nail varnish, I'll be fine. Um, so that's really exciting, bringing the history, disability history specifically, into the mainstream for everybody, um, which I think will be fascinating because it will challenge people's thinking um, and, and people love historical drama. So, you know, to be involved in, with that is such a thrill, something that I'm really proud to be doing. I, I don't know what the future is gonna hold for me um, in terms of what I'm doing and trying to achieve. I don't know whether I'm gonna end up teaching full time. It depends on the schools. I don't know whether I'm gonna end up doing a lot more research on the history, disability history or whatever. Um, I'm just taking each day as it comes at the moment with the pandemic going on, you can't really plan anything. And I'm just waiting to see what doors God, God opens for me and what I'm meant to be doing sort of that way. Um, but it's been a challenge for me embracing my disability, which I've never really done before. Um, and it's made me think about it in a, in a different way and not to be embarrassed by it because sadly I was. That's a really awful thing to say, to be embarrassed about your own body and not want to be in it. Sometimes the way I've described it to people is like um, how um, a transgender person might feel who's not gone through the transition. I feel like as if I'm an able-bodied person or a non-disabled person in a disabled body that's the only way i can i can put it and there's nothing i can do i can't transition into being non-disabled i'm stuck with what i've got so you either fight against it reject it you internalize everything and you grow hatred towards yourself and what you are or you embrace it and use it for good to change other people's attitudes. And, and, and now at 50 years, it's taken, taken me all that time to get to that position and that way of thinking. Because at the end of the day, regardless of whether you are black, LGBTQ, disabled, whatever you are, we're all human beings. We still have the same desires, the same needs, the same wants similar goals in life we all want to be happy we all want our families to be happy um, and we all want to make a positive difference to this world well, i hope i hope that we do um and then that's basically where i i'm at with everything at the moment and um i don't think that's really a bad place to be